What's up, peers, and welcome to join the Wasabi Cast, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. And today I sit down with Roger Proctor from Aero1.org, which is a phenomenal service offering private air travel in private jets. And Roger is, is very experienced in this area, having flown many, many miles and many hours uh, in, in private jets. Uh, and he has a breadth of knowledge and experience in the field that I thought would be incredibly useful and uh, important for you peers uh, to know as well. As I always had this vision in the very near future that we have a network of multiple Bitcoin citadels all around the globe, right? Free sovereign individuals gathering together in a local community uh, to build awesome shit, right? But what's essential to that vision is secure and private travel in between these citadels. And again, today on the podcast, we're going to dive into exactly how that is going to work out and what we can already realize today, what the trade-offs are and what the costs are, uh, but what is already now possible. This is going to be a really fascinating conversation. But before we get into it, one more shout out to all the peers creating this amazing show. And that's, of course, Saxonet in the editing, Ubuntu, in the timestamps and the amazing Igor Petrov with the beautiful artwork. So if you like the work that we do, uh, download the Breeze application, a Bitcoin wallet with a podcasting 2.0 enabled feature as well uh, to toss us a couple sats. And uh, not just this podcast, but uh, many podcasts, uh, over a thousand are now upgraded to this new protocol. Uh, so come join us on the bright side where the grass is greener and everyone can stack sats. But without any further ado, Let's get into it. Roger, how are you? Thank you for having me on Wasabi Cause, your show. Yeah, this, uh, this is, I think, is really a, a, going to be a great conversation. And I'm really curious to start out with this to kind of get your background and how you've created your life in the past. Sure thing. Uh, well, Max, I started out uh, as a trial attorney uh, for eight years, uh, and then I was hired over uh, to a client of mine uh, who had international operations all over the world. So I got a lot of experience flying um, millions of miles, literally over the next five years. Uh, and then I set up my own company, uh, Genix Capital, and then moved on to getting involved with the Bitcoin community, which is relatively new to me. However, historically, I was a, a study of um, objectivist theory and uh, the idea that uh, money it needed to be inflation proofed and uh, that that was a certainly an important societal goal. I was an early investor in precious metals such as gold and silver um, 20 years ago. And so this is kind of a natural conclusion, I think, uh, of that process is getting involved in the Bitcoin community, which I did very recently in June. Yeah, that is that is great. So how did you discover that love for flying and being in the air? The company that I went over to work for had as one of its divisions, uh, 135 Charter Operation in the United States. 135 Charter Operation is uh, similar to an airline where uh, one can hire an aircraft to take you wherever you want. Uh, my role there was to purchase or assist in the purchase of the fleet. We grew the company from three Learjets up to a fleet of 25 aircraft and worldwide operations over the course of five years. So that's where I got my start. That was 20 years ago now, believe it or not. Um, and then I went into a different business in the financial services industry, again, in the United States. I started that company in 2004. Uh, and from there, we grew into a nation nationwide company. And it was really the start of the pandemic about a year and a half ago, uh, March, March 17th, 2020, in fact, when I decided that commercial uh, travel was just not going to be viable for me anymore in order to be able to, uh, to, to play my role as the CEO of the company. Uh, and so I looked, I started looking for a private jet in which I found, and uh, we made a purchase in May of 2020. Yeah, that's a very long and very uh, experienced history already. Uh, so tell us a bit about that time with the charter company. First of all, what, what does that even mean to charter a, a plane and what are the nuances of it? Well, that's a very good question, Max. Um, charter, the charter business is, uh, has been around for many, many years. There are various different iterations of it. 
that are coming out. Uh, it's almost like a new flavor every month. You hear of new op opportunities, new options and whatnot. But the bottom line is this, um, it's, it's a service whereby one can uh, hire an aircraft and crew to take one from one point to another um, safely, securely outside of the, the typical congestion of major airports and going through security and all of those um, very painful uh, experiences where you basically drive up in your car to the jet, uh, the crew will uh, load on your baggage into the jet and you then take off and go to a secondary airport, have the car pull up to the jet again and transfer your luggage and, and you're on your way. It saves probably in the typical course of a flight uh, three to four hours of time. It's very efficient. It's not cheap. Uh, there are different ways to make it efficient, but it is a, it, it's a very efficient way to move around, particularly given uh, what's going on right now. For example, the other day, I'm not sure whether people uh, read, but American Airlines and Spirit Airlines in the United States had to cancel over a thousand flights in one day uh, due to crew and congestion and other bottlenecks that are occurring right now in the supply chain for air travel. So this is an alternative to that. And what I'm looking to do or what we've done with getting in and, and jumping in and, and actually acquiring an aircraft is to um, take that one step further. Yeah, exactly. There, there are many different uh, depths of involvement that could be done here. Right? I mean, the, the, the obvious thing that everyone does is, is to go to an, to an airline uh, just, you know, one of the, the mass providers, uh, then the next smaller step, I, I would guess, is the chartering. Uh, and then ultimately what's what comes next is, is the full ownership and right, where, you, where you actually own the plane. But let's let's maybe get a bit more into the differences between the, the massive airlines as, as you're kind of used to them and the smaller private charter airlines. Like what makes the difference between these two? Well, if we look at it, um, and superimpose aviation onto the Bitcoin model, which I think might be of interest to your um, to your listeners. The commercial industry is a centralized industry. It's based on central control, logistics, uh, centralized uh, equipment, and so forth. The private aviation world is quite different. It's very decentralized. It's private in the, in the full sense of the word. Not only um, is it customized to suit your needs, but information sharing and so forth is more private as well. So it, it's really decentralizing a very centralized industry for the benefit of those who believe in a decentralized world. The question now, and, and this is what I have had to grapple with for really 20 years, is how do you make that affordable to the, to, you know, to the average person? Um, it, it's very unaffordable, to be honest, and, and there are, are ways that you can make it more efficient but nonetheless, it's a constant struggle for us to try to make sure that, that this is an efficient tool that we're use, using and it's, it's really to our advantage and in, in many ways better than the commercial model. That's something that we're always challenged by, but we've made a lot of inroads and I'm happy to talk to you about what we've done in that way. Yeah, this is for sure one of the biggest benefits of the big mainstream airlines. Uh, it, you know, if you look at Ryanair, it's just the incredible cheap cost of, of a flight ticket. It's ridiculous, really. Um, and of course, that's not something that we intend to to, to compete with here. Right? It's it's a very different offering uh, because, again, Ryanair only flies between those big major airports that have a lot of these centralized infrastructures, right? Just the, the baggage claim and com common security checks and uh, all of these things, which, of course, provide some efficiencies at scale uh, and therefore cheaper costs. But, of course, a lot of the potential threats that centralized trusted service providers always provide. Uh, and we see that especially during the pandemic, how, how bad and how quickly uh, it can turn. Well, that's, that's exactly right. And, and make no mistake, we're not trying to compete with the right heirs of the world. I think that that, uh, that solution is a very good solution for a large segment of the population who need to go uh, shorter distances often. The one thing that I have found uh, since going from the commercial model to private model, it used to be on the commercial model that I would take trips really needlessly just to keep up my uh, 
my main airline uh, loyalty status so that I could be a top sta top tier status every year. And so the, the number of trips that I would take that would just be done to take advantage of that probably in some ways um, outnumbered the ones that I actually needed to take for business or my personal life. Now, um, I only fly when I absolutely need to. It's much more efficient. It's costly, but it's efficient to do so um, on an as-need as basis. And I find that I don't travel nearly as much. I'm probably traveling half today what I did two years ago, whereas before I would put on 150,000 miles a year. Now I probably will do no more than 50,000 uh, miles. Oh, that's so interesting, right? The difference of incentive models between these frequent flyer fi uh, flyer miles in, in mainstream air, uh, airlines, right, where you're incentivized to consume and consume and consume in order to get these uh, shitcoin credits, so to say, <laughs> uh, that uh, give you some that's free fun. free goodies uh, in the future, right, compared to the self-ownership approach, where you're incentivized to be as efficient with the scarce resources that you have at your disposal as reasonable. Right. And, and that ultimately leads, uh, well, to at least more efficiency. Right. That's that's a good thing. Well, uh, just on that point, Max, uh, I've been very conscious about the the efficiency of the model and how can we give back to others while we have control of a jet. And so one of the, the things that we have done is associated ourselves with a, a very well respected management company. Jet Logistics in the United States, where uh, they are primarily a Medivac company, and they're also an organ uh, transport company. They have contracts with some of the largest um, and most respected hospitals in the United States. And so we're, we're able to lend out the aircraft to actually provide a valuable service to those in, in need who are either ill, certainly um, sick with the pandemic, or in need of um, organs. And so that, that's, that's sort of our way to give back uh, because we, we feel very privileged to have the ability to, uh, to have one of these aircraft and one of these tools, but it's also important to, to recognize that and give back as much as we can. Yes, exactly. That's another great point, right? That once you have acquired this, this great capital good of a private jet, well, you're not going to use it all the time, and especially because it costs every hour to be in the air, right? So you actually make a cautious decision here. Uh, but then th what do you do when it's just sitting around, uh, you know, in, in the hangar? Well, rent it out to people who have a high need for it right? and, and a good use. And I would argue that uh, high importance and especially time sensitive organ transplant uh, movement is extremely important, right? And, and a great fit to be a in combi uh, to be used in combination here. Maybe tell us a bit more about how that works in detail. So the aircraft that we have uh, is is U.S. registered. Uh, it is both what we call Part ninety one and one thirty five. FAA uh, approved, which means in, in Part 91 under the Federal Aviation Regulations, uh, those are those regulations govern private aircraft used for private purposes, uh, a private flight department, uh, a private owner, and so forth. The FAR 135 regime is designed for uh, charter, on-demand charter services, and just to complete the picture, uh, commercial carriers are Part 121, they're governed by a different standard. Part 135 is a higher standard and has different requirements to be met, certainly by pilots and by the aircraft itself. For example, it, for an aircraft to be 135 compliant, it needs to have be fire rated. All of, all of the interior fabrics and furnishings need to be fire tested, destructive tested. And there's a, there's a very high level of requirements that must be meet, met in order for it to qualify for that, um, that part. Um, we decided to pay more money uh, in order to have it uh, FAA 135 compliant. And that then allows us the flexibility to put it out for charter through the management company. All of, that, all of that's taken care of for us to be able to fly these Medivac flights or, or, in transplant or for on-demand charter or whatever is appropriate. Uh, when I'm flying it for my personal use or somebody from my company's flying it, then it's flown on a, one, a 91 
designation, and um, and as such, it, it goes under the other regime. It's kind of a complicated way of saying that we wanted to have the flexibility of being able to offer it out for for those others who might have a need when we're not using it. Aha. Uh -huh. So there are three kind of different levels of aircraft. Right? The the one is the the owner op uh, the owner flown or owner operated flight. Uh, the the next is the charter right, to to basically use this aircraft to let um, well customers travel to any point that they wish, uh, and then the third is the the commercial airline right. So to do the same but on a on a large scale um, and much higher frequency, I would guess. And there is for each of these different building requirements, and right, so it's actually rather or it's not as expensive to get a. Uh, owner operated plane compared to a charter plane, because for example, you don't need uh, some of these fireproofing mechanisms and so on. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious, what are some of the uh, kind of other points of regulation uh, for these two types of private ownership and charter? Well, that's a good question, Max. Um, for one thing, uh, part 135 designations have geographical limitations to them. Uh, for example, if you have a commercial setting, I, I don't know how many of your listeners have ever wondered why, say, a Lufthansa uh, flight cannot go, say, from Frankfurt through New York through Hong Kong. Uh, the reason for that is because you cannot, that would, that would violate cabotage rules, which are really a worldwide set of regulations where you, you have to go either point to point within the country of your flag, if Lufthansa is German flagged, then point to point within Germany or point to point between Germany and one other country, but it can't go to multiple countries or it cannot fly, say, point to point within the United States, a foreign flagged country. And those, those um, restrictions then apply to 135, whereas in part 91, it's a little bit more lenient. Um, as such, uh, if, for example, I'm in Canada, I'm not permitted to use the US registered aircraft to fly point to point within Canada, taking paying passengers um, on charter. That's, that's illegal, it's not, um, it, it's not permitted. That's interesting and kind of seems a bit bizarre at first. What's the rationale behind that rule? I have no idea politics. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think it was a way, it was a protectionist way for flagged carriers to, uh, to keep their turf uh, protected from unfair competition. That, that's my guess, but that's just a guess. This has been in place now for decades. It's not, it's not something that's, in, that's a new uh, regulation. Okay, I see. But the, the interesting case in anything is that it does apply to charter flights, but it does not apply uh, to private ownership flights, uh, which would be, of course, a great benefit for owning a personal jet then. Yes, so long as uh, when, when one is flying private, one is not charging uh, a charter-based rate for those who are on board, that would not be legal. But for, for, for me to travel point to point within Canada privately, that is permitted. And similarly, cross-border, I can go to a number of different countries uh, in the jet. Yeah, exactly. How, so how are uh, border crossings in a private jet compared to a charter? Well, it's funny you should ask. As you know, or maybe some of your listeners know, uh, the border has been closed between Canada and the United States now for well over a year and a half. It's not ordinarily easy to uh, get across the border. However, because of the nature of my work and the nature of the aircraft's work in creating an essential service for uh, people who are in need to get to hospitals quickly or organs or other uh, medical equipment or whatnot, then we have special uh, passage um, opportunities and privileges that other people do not have. And we've taken advantage of that and we're very thankful for the governments of both countries that allow us to do that and for recognizing that we're providing a valuable service. Yeah, so that's very interesting. You, you have one aircraft basically that has, for one, your, your private ownership license as well as the charter license. And you use that same airplane to also transport organs for hospitals. Um, and that runs under the charter license, or is this a different thing? That would be that would be operating under 135, yes. Okay. And then because 
like because you the same aircraft is used for the the good service of transporting organs does that also mean you get benefits when traveling in in personal capacity when you're actually not at all transporting organs well generally speaking um, we respect whatever the regulation is of the countries at the time the regulations have changed throughout the evolution of the pandemic and so the, the the short answer to that is it depends it really depends on what regulation comes into effect at that time if, if we look at the canada us system uh the regulations would be subject to renewal or change every 30 days and it was typically on the 21st day of each month so we would we would look at what those regulations were at that time and then determine whether we fit within them or we did not. And so we would guide our travel, our cross-border travel accordingly. Now, once in the United States, uh, there are really no restrictions. Um, there's no um, there's no restriction on travel from state to state or what have you. Uh, generally speaking, there were some quarantine restrictions depending on what state uh, you were entering into, for example, New York or Connecticut. But there are other states such as Florida, Arizona, Texas, and, and, many, and a host of other states that had zero restrictions. So once we're in the United States, then we have completely free travel. We generally do not go to the main airports. Uh, we're at, in less congested areas and the free flow of, of um, travel and goods and services and what is, it's very uh, easy. Speaking of different airports, uh, what type of airports can you land at? And is it still possible with a small private jet to go to one of the really big airports? Well, one with a big enough runway. <laughs> uh, the beauty of the United States is that they have a very broad network of secondary airports with generous runway lengths. Uh, my aircraft needs a minimum runway of about 52, 5,500 feet. How uh, difficult is that to find? In the United States, not very difficult. In Canada, it is difficult. So we're quite restricted on where we go. There is no um, prohibition against flying into large international uh, or state airports. Uh, usually the landing fees and what we call the FBO fees, fixed based operator, where you actually go in and, and park your jet or get fuel or what have you, the, 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 the operator that services your aircraft the fees typically are higher at larger airports as well as usually the gas prices as well. So it, it, we, we usually choose where we go depending on what the cost to be there is. Yeah, that makes sense. And in, as you bring it up as well, how about parking the jet, especially for longer term? Well, that's, that's also a good question. Um, we actually have two base hangars um, on both sides of the border. Uh, that provides for long-term uh, hangering and storage and cleaning and maintenance um, of our jet. Uh, if we happen to be going to a place for an extended period of time, for example, uh, I was in Florida for a week uh, back in June, we would get, uh, we would secure longer-term hangar space uh, for, say, a week or what have you, so that the aircraft would be sheltered inside. Uh, I don't like keeping it outside. It's too expensive. Yeah, that is true. And to get back to one previous point of the difference between private ownership and charter, I'm also very interested in terms of uh, the uh, amount of personal information, like, for example, the passport uh, that needs to be shown for each of these options. Certainly within the United States or within Canada, or I think this is probably true of most countries, uh, passports are not required to go intra-country journeys. In terms of manifest lists and, and whatnot, it's my understanding that if one is on a Part 91 trip, um, manifests are not submitted to uh, regulatory authorities. However, if you're on a 135 trip, then they are. So it really depends, I think, on how you book that trip. Certainly cross-border trips, I believe the manifests are official at all times. Um, right now, there's talk about requiring vaccination passports to enter countries. We don't know how that will affect private aviation. I have to believe that it will be the same for private it is for commercial. However, that would not be the case for, um, for intra-state travel in the United States. 
Okay, so for, for every flight, you need that manifest of who's on board. But if it's a privately owned or operated flight, then you don't need to share that manifest with authorities. That is my understanding, correct. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, and how about things like the destination and departure points? A any, any trip that is booked uh, through IFR or instrument rated and basically manifest and whatnot, these trips would be logged per aircraft tail number. So the traffic, for the most part, the, the traffic would be logged, but the people on board would not be known to outsiders. So there's a, there's a sense of anonymity or privacy for those who are traveling in a, in a 190, sorry, in a 91 situation. And I know that for Bitcoiners, uh, personal freedom and privacy is, I think, held very dearly by them, as it is for me. So that might be uh, one advantage that one would have going through that process. The other advantage, of course, is not having to go through the arduous security and lineup process, which is so prevalent today at U.S. airports. The, the, the problem that we're seeing right now in, in the commercial market is that as things have loosened post-pandemic, although we're arguably still in a pandemic world, the, the ability for airlines to wrap back up and create a system that pre-existed before the pandemic began is quite challenging and very difficult to achieve. And so from, I, haven't, I haven't flown commercial since January 2020, but I'm told by those who do that it's a very painful exercise. Uh, there are many flights that are getting canceled last minute because they can't find crew to, to crew them because the crew did not have recurrent training. Um, they were kept on the payroll, but they didn't go through the recurrent training process during the last six months or a year. Uh, they're having problems getting uh, supply chains to, uh, to service uh, the commercial market and so forth. So it's, it's not a very pleasant situation right now, and I don't foresee it getting better anytime soon. Yes, I think we see, we will see the Austrian business cycle theory play out in the deep capital stages of, of commercial <laughs> flights. Uh, and we've seen the boom period over the last couple of years, and it was so glorious. Uh, but now we're in the bust, uh, and we see how much capital was misallocated. Uh, and that there's not enough crew members to pack all, all flights, right? That's, that's exactly the bust period. Um, so I'm, I'm curious how, how that will further play out, but it's good to have at least the, the option uh, of decentralized and self-hosted private air travel still. Well, and, and you're also seeing a, a, a sea change in aircraft types in the commercial market. You're going from, for example, Boeing 747s or A380s down to uh, single aisle smaller jets like 737s and A320neos. That's, that's a big change in philosophy. I think airlines are coming to the realization that the, the mass transport service that uh, existed pre-pandemic uh, has changed and possibly changed for a generation or longer from now. Meaning it's going to be harder to get tickets uh, on flights. It will be more challenging and probably more expensive in my view because the capacity has and is going to continue to go down. Now, what does that mean for, for the larger ecosystem? I think that's anyone's guess. It's a little bit too early to tell. I have my own views on air travel. Um, I, I think that every, ever, ever since the Pan Am days with Juan Trippé, who really believed in the mass market, mass air travel for everyone, and, and of course he and Bill Allen at Boeing co-developed the Boeing 747 that came into existence in 1969. That business model, I think, is being seen to be unsus unsustainable. Uh, the, the, the sheer cost and logistics, particularly in a post-pandemic world, uh, post-terrorist you know, a terrorist world uh, and, and all of the things that have happened since 9-11, makes it very difficult to run an operation like that in, in a way that's sustainable. So I, I think my view is in the future, we're going to see a reduction in overall airline capacity worldwide. We're going to see a movement to more uh, niche markets, such as um, what United Airlines has done in investing in a new supersonic smaller capacity jet to 
regain sort of the, the, the years of the Concord. And we're going to have more niche services like that. But the, the idea of just getting on a plane and going to Mexico or the Caribbean or, or what have you on a spur of the moment, I think those days are dead. That's my personal view. I think aviation is going to become more of a business tool and get back to the basics back like it was really in the 40s to 50s, 60s. It really seems that, you know, after the 40s and 60s, all the way up to the 70s, there was this this massive boom in, in the aviation industry. Like, for example, you know, the Concorde and, and, and great improvements in, in speed and range and, and things. But then ever since then, it, it seems to just continuously decline. And as you now bring up, you know, in the recent months, even more so. Uh, why do you think that we saw that peak and and drop down and will it increase to a pump in the future again? It's a very good question. When you look at the world circa 1955, it was really a, a commercial aviation world driven by the United States, both in terms of equipment manufacturers and airlines. And of course, back then, the predominant airline of the world, the world airline was Pan American World Airways, uh, Pan Am. Uh, Pan Am really led the way internationally and really at that time dictated where the market was going to head. The chairman, the longtime chairman and CEO of the company at that point uh, made a decision in, 19, in the mid 1960s as to whether to continue on with a luxury product that would be tailored to a specific set of people and go in say for example the SST route, the supersonic route, or build a very large aircraft to, to cater to the mass market. And he chose the latter. And what's interesting to me is a year before the 747 debuted, he he quickly retired. Um, I, I would argue it was almost like he realized he'd made a mistake because once you start to go on such a mass scale, the, the um, capacity, the all the stuff that goes into generating uh, the capacity for that is so complex that it becomes very difficult to weather downward eco economic changes or whatnot, um, some of the changes that occurred after 9-11. And we see what the result is, the natural result is that Pan Am went out of business. Uh, Pan Am couldn't fight in a deregulated market and simply lost market share and became ex extinct. Uh, now we have new um, airlines, relatively new airlines for that matter. I mean, Ryanair has been around for a while, but it has a very different business model. Southwest Airlines has a different business model and they've been able to weather the storm perhaps better. Uh, but I, I don't see the Pan Am vision anymore. I think that we're going to go back to niche markets and I think we're going to have uh, private aviation in some capacity uh, take over uh, some of the functions that commercial travel did in the past. Yes. Well, I do have my own pet philosophy, right? That in 1971, uh, with the full fiatization of the monetary system and a, a complete move of the gold standard, uh, we saw a natural centralization and, and decline of the aviation industry. And now with Bitcoin, you know, jumping uh, forward into the 21st century, I, I hope uh, that we will see a, a bounce back to decentralization and, and self-ownership and a well censorship resistant way of traveling that that really would be a nice comeback story for uh, the the beauty of flying well and certainly that that plays into the philosophy the personal belief system that many bitcoiners whom i've met over the last several months and by the way it has only been in the last several months that i have uh, really been introduced to uh, this space in some degree of uh, particularity. And so the people that I talk to who are cryptocurrency embracers, Bitcoiners and whatnot, it, it, is that they, they very much are rugged individualists. They tend not to value durable goods or material goods or material possessions, uh, but rather really value almost a sense of, uh, they're nomads, they're, they, they value the sense of travel. Um, these are people who who very much value uh, the experiences of meetups, physical get-togethers, not get-togethers online, but rather physical meetups in various different centers where they can talk to each other one-on-one -on -one or in a group 
and, and collaborate and, and gain experiences. And I, I found this personally to be very valuable. When I did this, I, I went to my first conference in Miami at the Bitcoin conference in June, and then met a lot of people and, um, and then went to some other events in different cities after that. So this is very interesting to me because in my experience, so I went to, I went to Miami on my own and then from Miami, we went to Austin to an event and I took some guys along to that. And then from Austin, one of the guys came back to me to Virginia. And, and so it, it's sort of, you know, these people who are just traveling all around. Um, and, and in my view, it, it, it was very educational because I could see, okay, for those who might own or have the, the privilege of having aircraft, why not marry those people up with those who need a ride? And maybe there's a way to uh, help defray costs together or whatnot, and, and maybe have a, a, a centralized schedule where those who are looking to get a ride can go on the schedule and see if there's somebody traveling with an aircraft that day that's on that city pair and, and have it kind of marry up together so that really we're, we're continuing this decentralized approach to air travel. And I think it's very exciting. And I'm doing that a little bit more with uh, some of the people that I know and, and, uh, and, and by the way, on board is a very valuable experience because we get to talk Bitcoin and the world and philosophy and all the rest as we go there rather than just sitting on the plane alone. It's a more efficient use of the aircraft. It's a more efficient use of, of resources. Um, and it's, it's, for me, it's personally rewarding. Yes, very much. And all of a sudden, when you have a bunch of Bitcoiners flying with you, you know, the three hours of boring sitting in a chair turn out into a very in-depth conversation about the, the nuances of the magical internet money. So Absolutely. It, that, you know, turns turns a long wait into an actually pleasant conversation. So yes, I, I do agree that there seems to be a, a demand for somewhat of meetups in the air, you know, uh, that, that would be cool. And it's all private. Uh, no one knows you're there. No one knows what you're talking about. You can talk without any fear of, um, you know, recordings or telephone. The cell service, of course, doesn't work on board the aircraft. I do have other avionics that allow us to communicate with sat phones and everything, but it allows a, a, a very secure environment in which to say whatever you want to say to each other. Yeah, exactly. Literally thousands of feet above uh, the next person that could hear you. <laughs> Well, this is all very interesting. And, and on your website, Aero One, uh, you offer that Learjet 35A, which, which really does look absolutely beautiful. But I wonder, before we get into this particular model, what are the different categories of planes that might be suitable for a personal jet ownership? Well, thank you for asking me that, Max. Uh, I have spent literally 20 years of my life uh, in you know, embracing the private aviation world. And even after I left the company that I worked for for five years, I continued to be interested in aviation. It's been a personal interest of mine since I was a child. Uh, there, are, there are really three main different categories of private jets. There's the light jet. There's also the super light jet now, but let's call it the light jet model, the mid jet and, and the heavy jet model. So if, if I were to give, and, and then there's, uh, other aircraft such as turboprops and piston engine aircraft and so forth. So putting aside the, the turboprops and the pistons, uh, the light jet example would be a 35A, a Learjet 35A. It goes 2000 miles uh, nonstop uh, at a speed of um, you know, over 500 miles an hour. Uh, it's comfortable for up to seven people, although usually I would recommend not more than four. It's crewed by two very experienced cab, um, pilots. Uh, it's a two crew aircraft and it has been around since the mid seventies. Uh, in my view, the Learjet 35A is by far the best all around aircraft in the category ever made uh, to this day. And as a testament of that, the United States um, Air Force and Defense have, I think over 30 of these aircraft today, even though they haven't been built since 1993. Uh, there's over 450 aircraft uh, still in the air today, and there's an abundance of parts. So it, it's, a, it's a robust, beautiful aircraft that has 
um, just a beautiful um, uh, sort of set of lines and, and it's just a lovely aircraft. In the mid-jet market, you've got uh, a, a number of different types. Um, Cessna has a number, the Sovereign, for example, uh, the CJ3s in the Learjet uh, lineup, Lear 60, Lear 45, and so forth. And, and there are others, Hawkers and so forth. In the, in the heavy jet lineup, they're, they're dominated by really two main manufacturers, uh, um, the Bombardier Global Express and the Gulfstream Series uh, 5, 6, and so forth. There are others, like if in Europe, the Dassault lineup is popular. Um, the Falcon jets made by Dassault. But those, those would be the main three. And then, of course, you've got the super heavy jets, such as the Boeing um, BBJ or the, the Airbus uh, CJ. But you don't see those very often. And like any tool, it has to be the right tool for the job. For me, uh, I generally don't do international travel anymore. Uh, I Most of my international travel before was, again, to accumulate lots of points to get top tier status with the airlines. Um, they, they, were, they were discretionary trips, not needed trips. So for me, uh, being within the continental North America, the Learjet 35 is great for my needs. Uh, if you want to have a larger aircraft with a proper, a full stand up lavatory and so forth, then maybe a Lear 60 would be more appropriate for you. And, and I think in my personal view, the Global Express, the original Global Express is the very best heavy jet money can buy. Um, you can go nonstop from Vancouver to Hong Kong, um, you know, Vancouver to Moscow, uh, and, and all, it, it will go about 6,800 miles. So it's a very good aircraft for that. That's a very limited utility aircraft for me. I would never own one. I think it, it's not appropriate for me. It's very expensive. But I could understand for those who do need to travel those long distances, it's uh, it's an ideal aircraft in many ways. If you're just uh, just to complete the thought process, if one is traveling uh, on shorter runways, or perhaps you have dirt strips, or you uh, you're going shorter distances and you want a more fuel efficient, more more efficient aircraft to operate, you might want to try a Piper Cheyenne. Or, or um, you know, caravan or something like that. It, it really depends on what you're looking to do. And I know some people have come to me wanting to uh, get some advice on on sort of the, the sovereign citadels that they're creating and what would be the perfect aircraft type for them. It's much easier to create a dirt runway than it is to create a 5,000 foot asphalt runway. And so some of those other aircraft types on a smaller scale may be more appropriate for them. Yes, exactly. Right. These pro small propellers are great because some of them at least can land basically on a, on a dirt field, uh, at least good enough. And I imagine that that's not possible with the Lear 35A. <laughs> I don't think so. I wouldn't want to do it uh, unless it was a dire emergency. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess an expensive uh, uh, crash course lesson. Yes, for sure. And then on top of just the aircraft type, you have a number of different ownership uh, options or share options. One of the things that we looked at very closely was the fractional ownership program. NetJets would be the best, the leading example of that. And comparing the fractional ownership with whole ownership or co-ownership or jet cards or what have you. And after a very careful analysis, we, my organization concluded that a co-ownership program may be most advantageous to many people. And, and basically the difference between a co-ownership program and a fractional ownership is the fractional ownership, you don't really own a share of an aircraft. You, you basically buy into a pool of aircraft that you have proprietary rights to, but you can't say, okay, that particular aircraft, I own half of that. It's, it's something quite different. And in my view, it's a, it's a more expensive and more complex program. Whereas our program is different. Um, the Aero One program is designed to, to choose an aircraft type that is most suitable for you, understanding that you're not going to necessarily need to use it um, four or 500 hours a year. In my case, I'll probably be 100 hours or less this year. So the aircraft has the capability and the aircraft, uh, 
uh, Learjet 35, for example, has the capability of operating up to six or 700 hours in a, in a single year. So if, it, if I'm only using it for 100 hours, it's a waste of an asset to just sit on the ground and not be used. And in my case, I do lend it out. But um, why not have, say, a group of two, three or four individuals share the cost of buying in, preferably in, in the same spatial hub. So there'd be a cluster of people, two, three, four people, and we can create um, a half share, quarter share or a third share for an aircraft. And then you save, obviously, on the input cost to buy the plane, but also in the operating costs. And Aero One also uh, sets you up with a, a management company, Jet Logistics, and all of the, you know, you can get dedicated crew. Uh, everything's taken care of. It's turnkey. You, you have all the, you, you pay three fees. Uh, the, the one is the upfront cost. You pay that at one time fee. Uh, uh, a monthly management fee, and then uh, an hourly per diem rate, depending on your use. We're very excited by this program. It was just launched in May. We've had some great interest in it. Um, it looks like we're going to have our first aircraft sold uh, very soon, and it will be modeled after the one that I bought and the system that I put into place. Uh, and so basically what we're doing is passing off the, the brain trust or the, the experience that we gained in our purchase to others to allow them to get in and have a similar experience at an efficient cost. Yes, and, and just one note on, on the method that you use here. I, I really appreciate that a lot because it's very similar to the free software, scratch your own itch type of ethos. If you have a problem, uh, annoying air travel, and uh, you want to solve it, well, you find a solution, the private chat, and you optimize that for your own purposes. But then you turn around and, and share what you've learned uh, with others so that they can benefit from that problem-solving approach as well. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's, that's a great mindset to have. And, and, and that's, I think that's really one of the strengths of the Bitcoin community, isn't it? Because yeah. they are collaborative. We all are very collaborative. We, we enjoy sharing the things that we've learned. Um, we're proud of what we've learned. By sharing them, we also learn ourselves what other, how other, people's, how other people um, apply what we've learned. And, and the collaboration is just tremendous out there with very smart people doing very interesting things that we, I, I wouldn't otherwise have found out about, including meeting you and, and many others in the group. Yeah, very much. Uh, so let, let's go through, uh, again a bit through the, the details of that shared ownership program and why it's useful. Um, I mean, for one, there, there are three different types of costs, so to say, uh, for having the, such an aircraft. And the first is, of course, the, the, the one-time purchase of it, right? Uh, how much is that roughly for a Learjet 35A? So right now we are offering uh, quarter shares in a 35A for, uh, I think it's $590,000. That's a one-time unleveraged fee. Uh, to purchase your share. And you own that share. You can sell the share if you wish. Uh, you enter into a co-ownership agreement with your other co-owners. If it's a four, then there'd be three other owners. If it's a three, then there'd be two others and so on. Um, and, and then, so that, that's a one-time uh, purchase price uh, for your share. And depending on the tax planning that you have or where you make your money, if you're, for example, an American paying U.S. income taxes, then there are some tax advantages to um, to ownership, and you can generally depreciate that price off in year one. the The second aspect of it is the month the monthly management fee, and that the management fee includes a number of things, including the cost of the pilots. Um, as part of this arrangement, you and your other co owners will basically own three pi three pilots. Two pilots in command and one second in command who we would we would marry up with you in the, the physical location where you are based and so the and so these you, these pilots are available kind of on demand the pilots would be part of your payroll it's all built into mm -hmm. the purchase price and built into the management fee so the monthly management fee would cover these pilots and so the reason we have three is because duty days are limited and so and, and you have to, I mean, obviously give people time off. So by having uh, a group of three, two pilots in command and one second in command, 
you've got pilots on demand 24 seven whenever you need them. And they would also reside in the geographical location where you're at and the hangar would be there where again, you were at. And so it's basically, uh, it's almost like a, it's part of a citadel. It's, it's your aviation citadel, mm -hmm. your hangar, the aircraft, the pilots, um, all of the provisioning and, and everything. It's all there in one nice package and we provide the entire package. Yeah, that's that's very fascinating. And um, and it, the, the nice thing is it's it's a hands-off package as well, right? So you, you don't need to worry about it. Um, but of course, you know, it sums up to $40,000 a, a month in, in the total sum of it, uh, which, you know, is, is substantial. So to have people around to share this cost uh, is is for sure useful. But then again, to yes, point that, out... that's 40000 that, that would be 40000 for four. So that would be divided by four. So 10000 per co-owner. Exactly. Month. Mm -hmm. yes. And and those are fixed costs, right? So they apply to whether you fly the aircraft or not, right? And that's one of the other obvious points why it makes sense to get multiple people involved here, right? because out of the potentially 600 flight hours, you're for sure not going to use all of them alone. Uh, and then getting other people involved to take some of the variable costs and fixed costs away from you uh, is, is, is for sure makes sense. Well, that's right. It, it, it... You know, for me, it's, it, it's, I haven't maximized the efficiency of my aircraft because uh, I happen to live in Canada and there's not a lot of demand for um, private aviation in Canada, largely, I think, because of the, the concentration of the population in the country and the size of the country. So for me, I'm, I'm a bit of an orphan in that way. And if I were living in the United States full time, I would certainly have more options available for me to get other like-minded people to go in with me. So I, I, I'm kind of at a disadvantage where I physically am located. However, for those who, who are, can get together, you, you, you know, the, the co-ownership system is based on having each of the four or each of the three or each of the two co-owners having a dedicated group of days per month that the aircraft is designated only for them. Um, you can sh swap and share if you wish but there are designated days or series of days for just you. And, and everyone, we hope, uh, operate in a cooperative manner. Um, there's our, there are carrots and sticks for making sure that that happens. But everybody I've talked to is very cooperative. They know each other, they get along with each other, they might even travel together from time to time. So that's not really a problem. If you get too many more people involved per aircraft, then it becomes a logistical nightmare. And, and so we've tried mm -hmm. to, um, to maximize the, the usage by, while also minimizing the logistical headaches. Yeah, yeah. I, I think shared ownership is always tricky, right? Because who gets to make the decision and who carries the responsibility and who pays for it all, right? That's always a bit tough. Uh, so to keep the number of people in that federation of ownership relatively small, is I think a, a good idea that removes a lot of the hassle that would have otherwise been. Absolutely, that that's completely that's completely fair. So we we're focused uh, on rolling out an ownership program, uh, creating these I guess they're aero citadels across the country, um, and sort of bringing all of the know how and experience that we've had getting this up. And by the way, I have to say a lot of this work and, and what really makes our program work is the experience of Jet Logistics and the owner of Jet Logistics, Ashley Smith um, Jr., who has really taught me a lot. So they're the ones who really uh, manage this and operate it and create headache-free experiences for us. Just to give you an idea, I, I don't know how many people out there have been trying to get uh, rental cars in the United States, but it's very difficult to get a rental car these days. Um, all of the logistics, the hotels, the cars, the transfers, everything are all arranged and provided by Jet Logistics in this case. Um, it's so headache free for me to get off a plane and know that a car is going to be right there and I don't have to worry about going out and trying to get one, which is, is painful these days. So it's just seamless, it's perfect. It, you pay those three fees and you're done. And it's, it's, I can tell you having traveled 50 hours 
in the last seven weeks, it works. I, I stress tested it. Aha, uh -huh, so that's interesting. Even the on the ground uh, air or car courier service is included in the operational price that you pay. Well, the, the so the the ground transport, like all of those are extras, but in my view, the cost is of secondary consideration. It's actually getting access mm -hmm. to these services that are that are in doubt right now. You you, you can't yes. get them. You can't get a car in many mm -hmm. instances. Yeah, again, we're we're living in massive supply shortages all around. Uh, so just to have these this capital available uh, and at the place and at the time where you want it uh, is is a, a great privilege to have. Yes, I was in twenty four cities in thirteen states in seven weeks. That's crazy, uh, and, right? <laughs> and and, and it, nowhere did I have a problem mm -hmm. in the height of the pandemic. Yeah, th that's that feels kind of like a superpower, right? I call it the time. It's a time machine, it's a time machine <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, people love Bitcoin because it's a savings technology, and you can save your time. But guys, just imagine how much time is being wasted at these massive airports every single day, every single month, every year, right? And how much time you could save while you actually own the aircraft, and there are no hassles. You just step out of the aircraft into your car and go, and that's it. Absolutely. It, 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 you know, a lot of people will say that private air travel is a luxury. And uh, one of my heroes, Bill Lear, who invented the Learjet, he also had the honor of being able to say he invented the 8-track tape player, which I don't know how many people know, but um, uh, he, he, uh, he also invented the, uh, the autopilot, believe it or not. He would say, no, it's not a luxury asset. It's a business tool. It's a tool to get you where you need to be, mm -hmm. where you need to be efficiently and safely. And the other key to all of this, which goes without saying, but should not be dismissed, is the pilots who fly me around and my people around are simply the best pilots out there, the most qualified, experienced pilots going. Some of them are ex-military. Um, they, they make me feel very safe in no matter what the situation is, which... You know, given today's uh, turmoil in some respects, it, it, it's a very comfortable feeling indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And uh, as you said in, in a private conversation, it's all about uh, the, you know, the, the worst case scenario and having the best people on the crew to take care of a tough situation when it happens. Uh, but when you're falling down uh, from thousands of feet up in the air, yeah, you want to have the best people to try to get you on ground safely. 100%. Absolutely. And you get to know these people. They, they become your friends and you have dinner with them and they're, they're just great. They're, they've got tremendous life experiences. They're different ages, they're different um, backgrounds. And it's just, it's just a great, it's almost, it's a family. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a mobile family that you're with while you're away. Yes, yes. And to highlight this here again, uh, as you mentioned it before, is that it does make sense that the owners, so the group of the owners and the pilots have somewhat of the same city as a base location um, and then to start out from there into the different travel areas that they do. Why is that important or what are the alternatives? That's a great question, Max. Um, one thing that many people don't realize until they go to, for example, get a quote for a charter is understand that one is not paying for an aircraft to take you from point A to point B. One is paying for the aircraft to get to your point A, to then take you to point B, to then get back to where the aircraft is originally based. And so you're paying for much more than just the legs that you fly. They're called dead legs. If, for example, uh, to give you a concrete example, if I were to charter an aircraft to take me from Vancouver to Scottsdale, um, there's not a, an abundance of aircraft that are in Vancouver. But let's say for, for a moment, that the aircraft that I sourced was based in a charter operation in Vancouver, then that aircraft would take me from Vancouver to Scottsdale, drop me off and come back to Vancouver. Well, I have to pay for that return leg or that portion. And right now, because aviation is in such a state that it is, it used, it used to be that charter um, services would have minimums and layover, say, for example, I want to be in Scottsdale for three days, 
that aircraft might stay there for that length of time and then take me back so I don't have to pay that dead length. That doesn't happen anymore. So basically what you're paying is double the actual cost of your bum being in the seat. Whereas with our service, you only pay what you use. And, and so charter can be very, very expensive. Um, it, it, it might be appropriate if you only need it a few, you know, handful of times a year. But once you get up over a certain number of hours, uh, let's say over 50 hours, then I think it becomes something to, to really consider uh, a co-ownership arrangement. And certainly if it's, it's, if it's over 150 hours or 200 hours, then you probably should have your own chat. Mm -hmm. I see. And uh, so, but how, who then pays for those dead leg flights if there are multiple owners who are in different cities? Another great question. So first of all, I don't recommend an own, a co-ownership program if you have diversity of jurisdiction within the co-ownership itself. I, I would not, for example, recommend an aircraft be owned by somebody in Miami, another one in Los Angeles, and another one in New York. That just is not going to work. Uh, you'd be better off just to charter uh, until you can find other people who are closer to you. Um, but I think if you are in the same uh, town, in the same city, in the same physical location, then there are rules within the co-ownership program that after you've had your stint in a month, everybody gets their own designated grouping of days, that it's your obligation to have the aircraft returned at your cost to the home hangar so that the next person gets it, can get it where they live. They don't have to pay for that. If, however, there's a conflict, and this is the carrot and the stick rule, then, um, and depending on the situation, then there's a sharing of the cost to get the aircraft back to the home hangar. But we don't believe, based on the low number of co-owners involved in that, that we're going to have too many instances where uh, dead legs will have to be paid. The aircraft will simply stay where the owner is at that time. And when the owner's finished from that, uh, that trip, they bring it back and it goes on to the next person. Mm -hmm. I see. And then I guess there will be kind of a, a, a main hangar being rented out for longer term at that base location and potentially short term hangar locations being scouted out for wherever the destination is. Yes. And that's part of the obligation of the flight crew and logistics to set those temporary hangar spaces up. Mm -hmm. How long in advance do I need to announce my travel plans? Uh, so it, it really depends on the situation, but I would say a, a matter of probably 12 hours. Certain, well, let me back up. If the travel plans that you're planning to embark upon involve the time that is dedicated to your usage of the aircraft, then, you know, it can be as short as, you know, a few hours. If, however, you, you need to go somewhere where, with during the time that the other co-owner has exclusive usage of the jet, then that might take a little bit of work to coordinate. Um, but you know at any point, so I don't know how other people are, but it, in my um, observation, the Bitcoiners that I know, most of them do not have normal working hours with a normal work week. They have a lot of flexibility in when they can choose to travel, uh, times and days and so forth. I am the same way. So I don't really have, I mean, I can count probably on one hand in a year that I have to be at a certain place at a certain time. I've got the flexibility to coordinate with the other owners uh, so that we all share in a, in a, in a reasonable way. And, and that significantly cuts down on unnecessary wear and tear and, and payment of dead legs. Yeah, I think flexibility and coordination and communication among the co-owners is essential here. And poten potentially there could be a nice app or something that makes that process a bit more easier. They, they do exist. They're off the shelf. And, and one of the things that we would like to do once we build out what I'll call these aero citadels um, is, is allow the owners to put on our site um, or a co-owned site the schedules of the aircraft. And like I say, if others in the community want to travel or need to travel, then, then that would be a matter between them 
and the owners to coordinate. If they could hitch a ride, then, then that's great. I call it a hitchhiker's guide. Um, if it's a 135 operation, it's not an issue. They can, they can co-pay, they can, you know, they, they can be charged for it. Um, but it, but it provides a service to these people in a very secure private environment where they might get to, you know, meet each other and like each other and become friends. Yeah, yeah, that's that's some of the very nice additional points uh, when having good corners, and I think that's essential. What about the ability to that one co-owner pays another co-owner in order to take some of his flight hours? Um, so one of the the advantages of our program that does not exist with the fractional program is that we have some flexibility given the robustness of the equipment that we use, namely a Learjet 35, uh, can fly a lot of hours uh, if, without breaking down. And so if, for example, you wanted to go from 100 hours a year to 150 hours a year, you can do that without impairing anybody else's rights, provided that the aircraft is available. Uh, whereas in the fractional program, if you want to buy 100 hours, you're not going to be able to get 150 hours for free. So it's, it's far less adaptable or flexible uh, for your needs. Um, it, it's, it's really the beauty of, of our program. It's extremely flexible. It's, it's uh, in my view, cost effective. Uh, and it's unique out there. I haven't seen any other program of its kind anywhere. And, and I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty in tune with what is going on out there in the world, at least in, in North America. Mm -hmm. Yes, as, as long as there's still technical capacity for the plane to take more, I guess we can scale that up. Uh, so are hopefully... You talking about, are you talking about people on board an existing trip or are you talking about um, buying more hours as a co-owner? So more of the example is that, you know, for one month, uh, in, instead of me using 150 or 100 hours as usual, right, I need to use 150 hours, but only for this month, right? And the other person this month spontaneously does not travel. So I, instead of me swapping my capacity for his, I give him a, a couple sats in order to get his flight hour capacity. I think that's a matter between co-owners and mm -hmm. I don't think we want to be overly strict on that. It seems to me that, you know, I always say that uh, people who can agree or people who want to work together, no detail is insurmountable. People who don't want to work together, all details are insurmountable. So it really depends yeah. on whether you want to work together or not. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, and, and I agree, you know, if you have a good tribe of people here together uh, that, that really, you know, negotiate here in good faith uh, i don't think that or i think that all of these small nuances will be resolved easily with with the number of people that we're looking at yes if you mm -hmm. said, if you mm -hmm. were to make eight you know one eighth shares i think that you could get into trouble very fast yeah yeah but what is interesting is that the that one owner can be a company right who in turn then is owned by multiple people yes that's true absolutely Mm -hmm. And then th there's also one interesting part here, right? Because there's a difference between the charter flights and the owner operated flights. But what if, and that usually means that if it's a private person owning it, right, that as long as that private person is on the plane, even if he has friends with him, that considers to be a, a private operated flight. But how is the situation if the, if the plane is actually owned by a company? Uh, so the company has people involved in the company, a company, as you, I mean, as you state, is, it's not an individual person. It's a, it's a legal fiction, really. It's a, it's a fiction person. Uh, the company would have employees, officers, and so forth. Those people who are working for the company or involved in the company would be able to fly on the aircraft um, as part of a, a 91 operation. If, if however, uh, the owner wanted to have paid passengers on board, either not be on board and have it chartered out to others who then take it and pay you for that at a profit or both the fixed and um, variable costs involved, then, then that would have to by necessity be a charter operation under part 135. Um, the, the aircraft is going out without you on board uh, your pilots are there and you're getting a fee for that service. That's charter. 
if uh, on the other hand, you have what they call a hitchhiker, somebody coming on board when you're on board um, and it's a, a 91 operation, then they can contribute towards the cost of that flight. They can only contribute in a limited way under 91 for variable costs. It's not a situation where you could have a passenger come on board like a hitchhiker and pay 90% of the cost of that flight. That's not going to work. Mm -hmm. That's illegal. That's, that's really, that's, you know, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck. That's a charge <laughs> thing. Uh, so it, you know, and, and within that there's blurred visions, but, but I, so personally for my use, I'm happy if somebody wants, somebody I know, someone in the Bitcoin community, I generally trust wants to come on board and share the cost. Then I'm, I, you know, generally speaking, I think that would be fine. Um, I personally don't like to charter my aircraft out to strangers. It's one thing to have a medivac team on board and or an organ or whatever, but I certainly don't want, you know, a rock band going from Las Vegas to LA and just, you know, destroying the aircraft. So we're very, um, we're very. Uh, we exercise a lot of discretion in who we have come on board if we're not there. So there's really two different categories. If you own the aircraft, you can charter it out if it's a charter operation. If you if you are going somewhere and somebody wants to come along and help pay the cost, that's great too. And to be a bit more specific here, for, for, help, for a hitchhiker to help out with paying the cost, he can only pay up to, let's say, for example, the, the variable hourly rate out of these $2,590 per hour. And he could not pay more to also cover, for example, the monthly uh, fixed costs. Well, let me be very clear because this is a specific question that is a technical answer. If the flight is being flown part 91, and by the way, I should preface all of this. While I am a lawyer, I'm not an aviation lawyer, so <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not giving legal advice, um, but it's my understanding that if it's a part 91 operation, then that person cannot pay more than a reasonable share of the variable costs of that flight. They would not be able to, you wouldn't be able to command them to pay a portion of the monthly management fee or, or mm -hmm. the fixed costs or what have you. Uh, it's, it's fairly defined. Now, if I'm operating point to point with the United States, I've got a US registered aircraft as part 135 uh, registered, I can do whatever I want. I mean, I could, I could charge them five times the cost of that flight if they were willing, if they were a willing buyer of that, of that service. Um, personally, I, I, I like the idea just philosophically of when I'm flying somewhere and I have to go someplace and I'm flying alone, it is simply not the most efficient, environmentally friendly uh, way to go. Um, I, as I said, I probably cut down a third to a third of my pre-pandemic uh, flight carbon footprint just because I fly far less than I used to. But even when I do fly, if I'm flying alone, and let's face it, most of us, when we look at it, we generally don't fly with a whole entourage. If, if you're having to go somewhere, you're actually usually going on your own or maybe with a friend, but you're not traveling with five or six other people. Well, my aircraft can hold up to seven people. So if I'm flying alone and somebody else has a need to go, um, why not offer them a ride? And, and, you know, it shouldn't be for free. They should pay something. And why not do that? It's an efficient use of the, of the jet. It's an environmentally friendly way to fly. And you're providing a service to others. Yeah, I agree. This is a win, 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 right? And uh, not just do you get to meet new people and share the costs, other people get a relatively cheap flight uh, compared for, for the quality of, of experience that you actually get. Well, let me give you an example. Here's a hard example. I'm flying from West Coast to East Coast uh, next month. Um, a friend of a friend called me out of the blue and said, look, Roger, um, I have business there as well. Um, do you think uh, me and you know one of the other executives of the company could come along with you? I said, great. Not a problem. I've never met this guy, but he comes pre-vetted pre by our mutual friend. So I said, look, how be, you know, just share. We'll do a third, a third, a third. And by all means, it's a win to me. It's a win to them. And when you look at it, they're probably paying a little bit more than a full fare first class ticket 
on the major airlines. So it's a little bit more, it's not the cost of a charter and, and these guys charter very uh, a lot. So their alternative for them would be to have to charter a plane at, at, you know, multiple times the cost of what they're getting at with me. And we'll have a nice lunch and we'll be able to chat and we'll compare notes and hopefully it'll be a pleasant experience for all. Yeah, yeah, this is really a, a lovely concept. Uh, so, Piers, put it on the, on the shopping list for your Citadel. <laughs> Get together with a couple of friends uh, from the local area and buy yourself a plane. I, th I think that's, that's much more fancy uh, than a boat. Uh, and, you know, it is, <laughs> it, it, it is much less prone to accidents than boats, uh, I would say. Uh, so hopefully you won't have tragic plane accidents to lose all of your keys. <laughs> no, I hope not. Well, Roger, this this was a really fascinating conversation. Uh, seriously, the, it's it's a, a very interesting topic, and you, you clearly know a whole lot about the nuances of it. Uh, so I'm very happy that that we got here together today at, at, to talk about this. But uh, is is there any major topic that you would still like to bring up that we have not yet covered? Um, well, it's been a pleasure, Max, and I really appreciate you inviting me on online today uh, to be with your listeners. Just just one last. Uh, thing, you know, private aviation is not for everyone. Um, it's uh, it's not. We're not trying to hard sell this. It either works or it doesn't work for you. Um, and you know, sometimes one one evolves into needing it at certain times. But I'll tell you this: uh, for me, it has been a godsend uh, for this very difficult time period in our lives of uh, air travel. And I I can't. I'm so, I feel so lucky that, uh, you know, my business and the people that work with me have really been, allowed us to be able to get this asset. It's been a tremendous benefit to us. So I hope that if, if those of you are in a similar position or if you would like to explore things, then by all means, um, speak to Max and get my number and we'd be happy to talk. Yeah, really fascinating. Uh, I, I think it, it was already obvious that this is a very useful tool before a couple of years ago, but nowadays, uh, you know, it, it, it's a no-brainer uh, that this is is a great solution for a private and secure travel, uh, both nationally as well as internationally even. Um, oh, on that note, one interesting uh, question still. Uh, what, what you offer is mainly in the Northern Americas, uh, but how about, for example, you know, North America, all the way South America, or even cross-Atlantic flights? Uh, what's the best options here? And does the Learjet 35A fit that too? So uh, the, the 35A does not do international sort of cross-Atlantic or cross-Pacific travel well. It theoretically can make those trips, but it would not be pleasant. It's simply not the right tool for the job. Uh, Central America, South America, it can do Caribbean uh, and so forth, um, but not th those longer leg over water flights that you have no uh, alternate or midpoint stops that you can deploy. In, in those situations, you know, I I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in taking baby steps. Well, it's not unforeseeable that I might need to, to do an international trip uh, to Europe or something at some point. I would probably look at chartering, um, or I would even consider, depending on the cost, even a, a commercial uh, service for that, given how infrequently I fly internationally these days. Uh, if, if, if anybody wants to look at charter, uh, it, it's certainly on a one-off basis, it's not cheap. It's, I will say it's more economical than buying an aircraft or even buy, co-owning co an aircraft. But I got to tell you, charter is not cheap these days. You're looking at probably over a hundred thousand dollars for uh, for a one way trip to Europe, given the deadly the responsibilities that you have. It's just very, very expensive. Yeah, that that is ridiculous for one flight, indeed. Yeah, it, I, I I find it cost prohibitive for me. So, uh, and I would assume a lot of other people would feel that as well. And that's why I think for those limited times when you have to fly those city pairs commercial may still be a viable option unless you're you know unless you have a thousand bitcoin and you just went up by 5x or something 
<laughs> well, you know, I said a couple of years ago that for, for well under 100 Bitcoin, soon in the future, you will be able to buy a beautiful inter-solar uh, system rocket and spaceship. <laughs> and, uh, we're, we're already there that only a meager 60 Bitcoin gets you a, a beautiful private jet like this one. Uh, so, you know, continuing the trend, we, we're, we're really not far that far out uh, from, from getting a spaceship it for, for sub-100 Bitcoin. <laughs> well, that's... That's right. I don't think I don't think it's even sixty Bitcoin. I think your uh, Bitcoin is at now. I think it'll probably be about uh, uh, I think maybe twenty twenty Bitcoin. I guess. Anyway, uh, it was very pleasant talking to you, Max. And and like I say, if I can be any help to your listeners in the future, please let me know. I'm more than happy to um, to help where I can. Yeah, really, really fascinating conversation. Thanks again, Roger, for joining us. Uh, and Piers, uh, if if you have too many sats and you don't know where to put them, uh, give them to Roger. He has a, a nice fancy toy for you in exchange. <laughs> <laughs> but but if you want to huddle on for for a couple uh, for a bit longer, uh, I, I would totally get it. Um, that's that's always a tough tough thing with Bitcoiners, right? Uh, all, all this potential future uh, wealth of the treasure hoard that we're sitting on, and and the time preference of when to spend how much of that. Uh, it's tricky, uh, but Roger, your offer is, is very, very tempting. Well, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Yes, Piers. See you on the next show. Bye-bye.